Hello everybody, uh, my name is Dr. Arun Deer and I've got a very special guest with us today. I'm really proud and privileged to present Dr. Robert Rutledge, who is the founder of Mini Gastric Bypass. Welcome to Australia, Dr. Rutledge. It's a delight having you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Deer. Pleasure. So, Dr. Rutledge, this uh, interview I thought we will host for the benefit of people who might be interested in hearing from you, specifically about certain aspects of the mini gastric bypass, a procedure that you created almost 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So can you please tell us firstly, what is the mini gastric bypass? Well, of course, uh, again, uh, I need to thank you for the invitation uh, to be in your wonderful country. And um, I do appreciate that. And I think that before we say anything, if I have your permission sure. about surgery, we have to talk about the issue. And the issue, of course, is this new worldwide epidemic of the combination of both obesity and diabetes. And of course, you know that well. Um, and of course, we as surgeons, maybe we feel like we should dive directly into the surgical portion of that. But I think if patients are listening, if we have friends and family that are listening, the first thing we, I think, are required to say is that this new epidemic is one of our making. It's one that we are in the midst of. It's one that is truly at epidemic proportions that so in my country, up to a third of Americans will be facing diabetes and obesity in the coming period. So we look at a devastating impact on our society with these two very serious and occasionally deadly diseases. And they are diseases of our making. They're new onset diseases where we have conquered infectious diseases. We have conquered in many ways the diseases that have bedeviled humanity for centuries. And now with this new environment mm. of bad food, of junk food, of McDonald's, Pizza Hut, the these uh, uh, candy, yes. fat, junk food, and then our lifestyle Correct. that we spend our lives now sitting and watching a screen yes mean that these two things are bringing on this disease and not in everyone, but it is an overwhelming disease. And so if you'll forgive me, the first thing we should say is stop doing that. Exactly. To our readers, to our listeners, to all of those people here in Australia and around the world who might be listening, we shouldn't live this way. We need to get up, we need to move, we need to exercise, we need to live a healthy lifestyle and eat a healthy diet. Yeah. Exactly. Um, now. We also know that even those people who eat an unhealthy diet don't always get obese, Correct. don't always get diabetic. So there is something inherent in the individual living in this society which makes them at risk. And we certainly encourage them mm -hmm. when they face these serious illnesses to intervene and try and eat healthy, Correct. exercise, and get away from these problems on their own. Mm -hmm. But having said that, I need to turn to the listeners and say, we know from the research that diet and exercise in serious obesity, in morbid obesity, right. in severe diabetes, routinely is ineffective. It doesn't work. It should, in theory to us, we should say, you should exercise and get better. You should eat healthy and get better. Mm -hmm. But we know from not 10 studies, not 20 studies, not 100 studies, but more than that, that diet and exercise as a primary treatment for severe obesity and diabetes is ineffective. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And we can't quite explain why, except that possibly this abnormal lifestyle and these bad foods actually poison the system in some way, mm -hmm. so you can't get back easily. And in those cases, in those cases where a healthy diet, good exercise, doesn't fix the problem. Mm -hmm. That's where surgery can be appropriate, can be, I would even say, life-saving. Mm -hmm. And we don't want that for our patients unless they come into this situation where their healthy attempts fail. And on that note, Dr. Rutledge, I know there have been several studies done on, you know, the Biggest Loser show, which has been quite popular. Yeah, yeah. And they've followed these patients or these individuals and while diet and exercise can work for a period of time, it's the maintenance of that weight loss that gives us the benefit. Well, and that's Thank the you. thing, that's what falls down. Mm -hmm. and, and again, you bring up the TV show, okay? You know, there are TV shows where men fly. 
Okay, that's not real. <laughs> and the biggest loser, unfortunately, is not real yeah. because it implies yeah. that if you take on this tremendous commitment, yes. work out constantly, eat healthy, that you're going to get thin and maintain it. And that's the problem with that because many of our patients who are overweight, they say, because I have failed, there's something wrong with me personally. There's something wrong with my willpower. There's something wrong with my commitment. And what we would like to tell, I think, our listeners, that's not right. Most of the studies suggest that any kind of strong diet and exercise program will be successful short term. Yes. And that by the end of one year, that initial weight loss will be regained mm -hmm in 85% and by two years, 95% and usually with more weight put on. Correct. So that uh, while we encourage eating a healthy diet and exercise, and that's critically important mm -hmm. so that the weight and obesity and diabetes don't worsen, yeah. as a cure, it rarely, if ever, works. Mm -hmm. And so we do think then surgery is appropriate. In those cases mm -hmm. where a good effort has been made, we, I think, need to say, we do not blame the victim. We do not blame the obese person for this yeah. illness. We do not say, this is like someone who commits a crime and mm -hmm. you are to blame for the obesity. Just the opposite. This is person who is in our society, with our societal available foods, lack of good opportunities for exercise, mm -hmm. and this then harms them. Right. And so there, we think in those cases, surgical treatment, especially imagine, imagine if we could treat obesity, severe obesity and diabetes with a 30 to 60 minute operation that required only overnight in the hospital and could give relief from some of the devastating social and medical consequences of such complications. Well, that's exciting and I think that's what's worth talking about. Absolutely. So coming to the question, what exactly is the mini bypass and how is it different to the conventional bypass that a lot of people are used to? Well, what we want to say is, I think, beginning with a little bit of humility. And that is, we as surgeons have a long history now of trying to operate to fix obesity. And that history has been marked with failure. Uh, it's been marked by good, honorable people trying to do their best and with some success, but also with a lot of failure. And so there are operations with big names such as jejunal ileal bypass, which was adopted, failed, and abandoned. There's something called the vertical banded gastroplasty, which you know about, which was adopted, thought to be a great choice, and abandoned. There was something called a horizontal gastroplasty, adopted, abandoned. There is, in your country and around the world, the lap band which was uh, adopted and then largely, although not completely, but largely around the world, yes. not completely, but many surgeons have abandoned it. And now we have uh, two popular operations, the Roux and Y gastric bypass, but there are some issues with that. Mm. And there's something called a sleeve gastrectomy, which is a good operation, mm. but some surgeons have some issues with that. Each of these operations have their benefits and we have no criticism of them, but the mini gastric bypass was designed specifically to try and address some of the shortcomings of the other operations. And so what we would like is to search for that ideal operation. What would be the ideal operation? And so if I have your permission, I'll list some of the things that might make an ideal operation. Well, it should be short. You know, in other words, like it's awful to have appendicitis, but we're excited if your appendix can be removed operation-wise in a short period of time and you can get better quickly. So we'd like a short operation. We'd like a small amount of pain and discomfort. We don't want a lot of nausea and vomiting. We'd like to be able to eat healthy. We'd like to resolve the important diseases that go along with obesity. We'd like to make the patient better from those standpoints. And we'd like to have low risk. We'd like to have an opportunity so that problems and complications, minor ones like a, a little redness or a upset stomach or things like that are low, but also serious and deadly complications up to including death. We don't want those. We want a safe operation, like we want a safe travel when we go for a flight on a jet. We know there are dangers, but I want a safe flight. So we want a low risk mm. procedure. And then we want more. We want more than that. 
we want to be able to have this reversible or revisable. If I don't like it, I want to return it. Yes. I want to be able to take it back to the surgeon. I want to take it back to the store and say, take it back. Yes. So we would like, ideally, an operation where we could undo it. Yes. And one of the nice things we think, if you list the things that are important to our patients. Mm. We did this in a survey of over 3,000 patients. We got a total of about 30 things that right. people would like. Right. These are the topics that they said would make about an attractive. A, about a bariatric operation. Yeah, what would right. make the operation ideal, ideal for them? And of those right. 30 things, mm. one of the interesting thing about the MGB is it really addresses almost all of those things and most of them, maybe all of them, better than the sleeve or the Ruin Y, which are also good operations, yes. but the MGB comes closest, in our opinion, to an ideal treatment for obesity and uniquely for diabetes, and particularly mm. in the growing number of thinner diabetics. That's and so we can talk about that later okay. if you wish. Dr. Rutledge, would it be fair to say that the mini bypass combines the benefits of both the sleeve and the bypass into one operation? Well, I think that I would like not to say it that way. I think that the, the, there is some similarities. In other words, if you look at it, the MGB has a long, narrow gastric pouch, Correct. somewhat similar to the sleeve, Correct. but not important ways, not in important ways, not similar. And it's also a bypass, so like yes. the Ruin Y. So Correct. there is some basic physiology that looks similar. But we would also say there's a lot of confusion among surgeons and patients when they get the three of these mixed up. Yeah, and uh, it can be complicated to try and explain that. Sure. But maybe the simplest way is vomit or not vomit. So let's think about this for a second. Mm -hmm. If I take your esophagus, your swallowing tube, and squeeze it shut, yes. and you have dinner, you swallow and, okay, this in surgical or medical terms is called obstruction, a blockage, right. okay? And if I do this, if I reach in and grab your esophagus now, yes. or mine, yes. I, sorry, no, I don't know you well <laughs> enough to okay. grab your esophagus. <laughs> if I grab that now, yes. you know what? We'll probably lose weight. Yeah. Yeah, we'll exactly. probably lose weight, but I don't want that, No. okay? The sleeve and the Ruin Y grab the patient's stomach. Yeah. They grab the stomach and squeeze it shut. The lap band grabs the stomach and squeezes it shut. And the mechanism of action mm. in the sleeve, the band, the Ruin Y is all obstructive restriction of eating. So that what you see is vomiting. Now, there are studies published in the medical literature. You know, the National Library of Medicine in the United States publishes thousands and thousands mm. of medical studies. So if you, for example, were to go look up sleeve gastrectomy and vomiting, which I have, yes. there's over 300 yes, studies, studies. Correct, yes. because it makes a small narrow gastric pouch and it has the bottom outlet called the pylorus. Correct. And when you eat with a sleeve, you're likely to vomit. Okay, now you lose weight, yes. but then something happens. And that something is the same that happens with the lap band. Because the lap band creates a tight, narrow, non-elastic, non-distensible, iron bar plastic block and Correct. people lose weight with that right yeah. but then something happens and the ruin why makes a small tiny gastric pouch and a small tiny connection and people lose weight yeah. but here's the bad news with the band the sleeve and less but with the ruin why people gain weight now the blockage doesn't necessarily go away mm. the lap band it doesn't go away at all no but they gain weight, and so the question is why and how? Well, the reason is simple. They learn that eating a piece of broccoli causes vomiting. Okay, piece of broccoli, bleh. an apple, bleh. a sandwich, bleh. but wait, what do they learn? After one year or two years, what do they learn? What will go through that? Chocolates and the ice creams and the shakes. <laughs> wait, wait, I, this is my, I'm, this is, wait, I was going to say that. I was going to say Coca-Cola. I was going to say soda. What they learn is they can get a thousand calories yeah. in for breakfast with a Coca-Cola. That yeah. is the lap band, right. the sleeve, and the Ruin Y teach the patient to eat pathologically. Yeah. 
They are learning, unfortunately, against their willpower in many cases, yeah. that they can't eat broccoli, they can't eat a carrot, mm. that they can't have that without very severe discomfort or actually vomiting. Yes. And so they learn what will go down. And you are already ahead of me. You said it, which I was going to say. <laughs> I'm very upset. He took so. I was going to say. But the ice cream, yes. candy, yes. potato chips. Yes. In other words, the worst of junk foods are great yes. for beating the system. Yeah. Or beating the system. And they do indeed all gain fame. Mm as a failed operative procedure yes. because over time those patients regain their weight. They That's regain true. their weight, okay? Yeah. Now the MGB, when it was first presented, there was lots of surgeons going, well, this will never work. How can this work? Mm. The stomach mm. pouch is too big yes. and the connection is not tight and narrow and obstructive. Mm. But the mechanism of action of the MGB is different. And so it's a little complex to explain, but basically, if you drink a Coca-Cola with the MGB, you get upset stomach, which we call dumping syndrome. Mm. On the other hand, broccoli, that's good. On the other hand, an apple with an MGB, that's good. Mm. And on the other hand, a small amount of different kinds of foods with the MGB, happy, satisfied. But the MGB, in contrast to say the sleeve, in contrast to the Rue and Wire, the band, mm. too much Coca-Cola, too fast, too much ice cream, too fast, causes severe upset stomach. So instead of enforcing a bad diet, the MGB actually enforces a more healthy, what we would call kind of a Mediterranean type diet. Mm -hmm. And the mechanism of action then is different. It's more healthy and more enjoyable. Absolutely. So when we've surveyed our patients preoperatively in America, they drink on average four sodas a day. That's the average number. Wow. And postoperatively, it's down to less than one. And preoperatively, they don't eat any yogurt, for example. And postoperatively, they eat yogurt. Preoperatively, they have three to four servings of fried food every day. And postoperatively, it's down to less than one. So what we okay. see is that the MGB enforces a healthy diet. It does have, if you look at the picture, some similarity, but it's very different physiologically and how it provides the patient with a new uh, more attractive and beneficial, enjoyable lifestyle. Fantastic. Dr. Rutledge, you did mention about the ideal operation that as bariatric surgeons, we are on this journey of evolution and finding one. How would you describe your ideal patient and what can they expect after surgery? Well, one of the exciting things is we have long-term follow-up on thousands of my patients. And I would mention, if anyone's watching this, you can come to our Facebook page and talk to hundreds and even thousands of my patients who've had the MGB more than five, 10, and up to 15 years ago. And they participate every day on our site. So you can talk to them directly. But what they tell me is they have a great life, that their diabetes goes away, that they lose weight back to a normal weight, that they can eat normally as long as they follow our guidelines. So they cannot, for example, as we just talked about, sit down and have a Coca-Cola and an ice cream because that will put them on the floor with an upset stomach and mm. pain and discomfort. But if they get up early, they eat six times a day, if they include yogurt and healthy fresh fruits and vegetables, avoid high amounts of bread and pasta because a large amount of that can be upsetting to their stomach, yes. that they really uh, tell me that they are enjoying their life. They can eat a very healthy, small, moderate diet, mm. and they get guided into eating that diet uh, by the MGB, and it leads them to what they tell me is a, a life that's frequently free of their diabetes, long-term have excellent to better than sleeve and ruin Y weight loss, and uh, so overall, it has a very good long-term outcome. That's what we're seeing. And again, what we recommend before you choose any operation is talk to 10, 20, or maybe even 100 people who've already had the operation, ideally at least five or 10 years, because many of the operations, like the band, even have good results for three to five years. Yeah. So in a sense, you're saying do your research. A well-informed patient is a well-prepared patient. Yeah, and I don't want to say that. You don't have to necessarily do a lot of research for a hernia repair. You don't yeah. need to do years of education and research for lapros yeah. laparoscopic gallbladder surgery, mm -hmm. but bariatric surgery is different. And right. unfortunately, I think all of us are sad that we have a history of bariatric surgical procedures that failed. Correct. 
Correct. And we have in our experience, in our short lifetimes, well, your short and my long lifetime, <laughs> that we have seen failure of surgical procedures. We're seeing it today. Yeah. We know that revisions of lap band, revisions of sleeve are common, right. more common than we wish. So we encourage mm. patients that we do not have a simple answer like we do for laparoscopic gallbladder surgery. We have right. a very good, simple answer. We don't recommend you spend hundreds of hours educating and researching laparoscopic gallbladder surgery or hernia surgery or even mm. colon surgery. Mm. We think that in general, those are straightforward and the answers are clear. Uh, we think MGB is maybe the best answer right now, mm. but not everyone agrees. And so we recommend aggressive attempts to kind of look into that and make your own decision. Uh, Dr. Rutlish, I've heard you say in the past that mini gastric bypass is a very powerful tool. And with power comes risks as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, the one thing that I'm curious, you did touch upon the dumping side of things. One thing that I often get asked is bowel reflux. My own patients ask me, what do you think, what is your view about it? Well, one of the things that we see a lot of confusion about is bile reflux. Okay, what happens is we have a normal part of our digestive system, which is called bile, and helps digest food. And occasionally it can come back into the stomach, even in a normal person. It's more common if you do the type of connection we do called the Bill Roth II. And unfortunately, there's a lot of bariatric surgeons who don't understand this. They don't understand the Bill Roth II and they have a fear of bile reflux. It turns out that the Bill Roth II connection that we use is done all the time, every day, in every country in the world as the most common treatment for connecting the stomach to the intestine. It's by far, two thirds to 90%, the most common type of connection between the stomach and the bowel. Right. And so it can have bile come up back and forth and it can be a problem, but it's very rare mm -hmm. in the hands of a skilled bariatric surgeon. Now, what we found is if you take a surgeon who's skilled at the sleeve or the Roux and Y and without training, if they start doing MGB, they can have problems. So we recommend that if somebody is considering MGB, they we recommend they should see a surgeon who's skilled in both the performance of the operation and the management post-op. Okay. Because the other thing we found is even if a surgeon does a really excellent connection between the stomach and the bowel, a patient can cause bile reflux by just eating too much mm. of a food that acts like a block. And if I can explain that, it turns out that if we eat a whole bunch of bread, if we eat a whole plate of spaghetti or noodles or rice, mm. when that goes into the small intestine, it can slow down the speed in which it moves through the gut because it acts almost like a cork. And if that happens, the bile can build up and the patient can have trouble, but it doesn't mean there's any problem with the operation. It means that the patient should need a plate of spaghetti, for example, mm. at 10 o'clock and then go to bed at 12 because yes. they may have trouble. Correct. But again, we find that new MGB surgeons and new MGB patients may not know this. Mm. They may see bile and they may actually move to have an unnecessary operation. So if there are any patients out there and you have any troubles like this, contact me before you have surgery because you might not need anything other than just don't eat spaghetti at 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> so, but there's a lot more complexity to it than that. Yeah. But I think the simple answer is hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of these types of connections that Bill Roth II has done every year mm -hmm. without problems or complications. The concern that we have from surgeons who are bariatric surgeons and not well knowledgeable about this mm -hmm. is they recollect an operation done by Dr. Mason almost 40 years ago. It was right. the very first gastric bypass and okay. that yes. violated some basic principles of general surgery. It hooked the loop of bowel up near the esophagus and that we know as general surgeons should never be done. And those patients did poorly. And so what we see is a lot of bariatric surgeons confuse that erroneously performed operation with the MGB, which is done according to standard general surgical technique, low in the abdomen, low in the stomach, near the antrum or the bottom of the stomach where bile reflux is rarely a problem when the operation is performed by a skilled surgeon and the patient understands the things that can cause bile reflux if they eat incorrectly. Great, great. So I think that lays to rest the myth that the bile reflux is a big issue uh, after a mini gastric. Yeah, I think we would say it's a big issue, for example, in a patient who's not 
well educated about what to do. Sure. And it can be really a problem in surgeons who don't know much about the MGB and perform twisted or kinked gastrojejunostomies and connections. So we have seen that bile reflux can be a problem. It can be a problem in patients mm. who are not well educated yes. because their surgeon is not well educated or in surgeons who are skilled as sleeve or are and Y surgeons and come to MGB without adequate preparation or education. Uh, I've also heard you say, Dr. Rutledge, uh, on occasions, and not today for, for this interview, but you know, the fact that the MGB can be customized, mm. it can be adjusted. Yeah. Tell yeah. us, how does that happen? Well, one of the most important things we think about the MGB, and there are many, many things, is that um, one size does not fit all. When you go to buy shoes, Exactly. you check the size. When you go to buy a shirt, you check the size. When you go to buy anything, when you take a drug, the drug dose for a baby is not the same for an adult. And so in the same way, an MGB can be tailored to the patient. So one example is that the longer the bypass, the more powerful it is. Now, there are people who are doing a very long bypass. They're called the SADI or the biliopancreatic diversion. This is a very long bypass, it's very powerful, but it's also very dangerous because it has a high incidence of deficiencies, mm. excessive weight loss, and even death. Mm. Uh, there is also the Ruin Y, which has a very short bypass. And that's a good operation, but oftentimes there's weight regain right. and there can be inadequate weight loss where people don't lose enough. The MGB uses the knowledge and our experience of thousands of patients to tell surgeons and patients that we can decide preoperatively to use a more or less powerful operation based on the patient. So imagine the patient is super obese. In other words, not just obese, but very, very heavy. Yes. In that case, the patient, the family, and the surgeon can discuss the potential to lengthen the bypass. If they do a longer bypass, they have an increased amount of weight loss, we would predict from our data. But we also need to explain that like the biliopancreatic diversion and the SADI, they increase their risk slightly of having too much weight loss. And, but the advantage of the MGB is we can sit and talk with the patient. The surgeon can judge the patient's needs versus the risks. and if the patient gets the extra weight loss that's needed and no more, all is well. But even more important, God forbid, if the patient suffers a complication. Mm. Okay? In other words, imagine that in an attempt to help the super obese patient, they lose too much. The beauty of the MGB is it's reversible and revisable. Mm. And the reversal or revisal we never wish for but it can be done in anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes. And in my series, mm. 40 minutes. Now, we don't say 40 minutes because I'm a fast surgeon. We advertise, we talk about, we explain the 40 minutes because revision and reversal of the operation is it easy to perform, straightforward, low risk operation. And it's important that your surgeon understand this and the patient be aware of this because the surgery is powerful, but it's imprecise. In other words, we can't say precisely how much the person will lose. Mm. We can predict in general, but some people lose a little more and a little less. And again, that's even more of an argument, the way I think about it, mm. that we want an operation that can be tailored. Yes. Because yes. if you have this operation and you're not satisfied, you would like more weight loss, the MGB can be tailored and made longer. If you have the operation and you have a complication and you lose too much, again, by a well-educated surgeon and a well-educated patient and family, we shorten the bypass or we can undo it. Yeah. And again, all of these things are easily done with the MGB, not easily done with the Ruin Y, and in the sleeve, it can be irreversible and deadly. Correct. So for example, in the Punjab, where you and I have spent some time, we know that alcoholism is a yes. problem. And so if you do a sleeve, for example, which has been done mm. in Punjab, and the patient who says maybe I'm not drinking and then they start drinking and they have liver dysfunction, the sleeve cannot be reversed. And we know in my city that I'm aware of in Punjab, we've had death from liver failure after sleeve. Yes. In MGB, we've had people who told us they had stopped drinking. The MGB was performed, then they began or they continued drinking. 
they had liver dysfunction and we reversed the surgery and they got better. Again, sleeve irreversible and death, MGB reversible and life. And again, that ability to tailor the operation to the patient we think is very important. And maybe most important is our future. In other words, if I have your permission, Absolutely. I'll talk about diabetics. So Correct. you and I in the past, we yes. called ourselves bariatric surgeons. Correct. And the idea, of course, is our surgery was focused on those who were super heavy, very yes. heavy. Morbidly obese was the name. Morbid being deadly, mm. serious obesity. Correct. Well, now, as we talked about in the opening, we said there is a new addition to this epidemic. It's not just obesity, it's diabetes and obesity. And what's exciting potentially is we've changed our names to now be metabolic surgeons. Correct. And what that means, of course, as you well know, is that we're not operating only for the obese, yeah. but we're operating for those people who have other metabolic diseases. And we exactly. think that of all the operations uniquely, the MGB is ideally suited to using as a treatment for the thinner diabetics, those mm -hmm. people who do not need to lose weight as much as they need to cure their diabetes. And that bypass of the duodenum is critically important. Mm -hmm. And again, because we can shorten the bypass, we can eliminate the weight loss, but still cure or improve the diabetes. So again, one of the ideal features of the MGB is this ability to tailor it to the thin diabetic, the super obese, and anywhere in between. Dr. Rutledge, it's been a delight hearing you. <laughs> I tell you, you have got so much information uh, and I'm so impressed and touched by your passion uh, for bringing about change in people's health. I thank you once again for your time and I congratulate you. Thank Thanks. you, sir. Thank you.